So Kerry Brown Lima heard me give this talk at the biocontrol uh, conference in Switzerland early this year, and she asked me whether I could give something similar uh, to you guys. So that's what I'm doing now. This was something that I prepared for a, a group of biological control scientists who, who gather uh, periodically to discuss their, their field. Um, now I hope I'm not going to insult your intelligence, but uh, I was warned that there are some of you who may not know uh, much about biological control. So I was asked to include a, a couple of slides about just to introduce the topic of biological control. So I've got three slides that address that. Um, the first thing to consider is this phenomenon of ecological release where you introduce a species to a new area and it's released from all its predators and pests and pathogens that keep it in check at home. So what you see there is a bunch of rabbits, for example, taken to Australia where there are no predators and they took over. So biological control is really the introduction of some of these enemies uh, from the home range of the invasive species to either destroy it or to, to reduce its rate of spread. Now, you, one often gets asked whether biological control is dangerous and there are a lot of things that, that can go wrong. Uh, and these are just bad examples of things that have gone wrong in the past. So cats that are introduced to control rats on islands end up eating all the birds. Or cane toads that were introduced to Australia to uh, control sugarcane grubs ended up eating everything except the sugarcane grubs that they were introduced to, to control. Foxes were introduced to control rabbits in Australia and they went feral and, and so on. So. This use of generalist predators to control alien vertebrate pests is not responsible biological control and it's no longer practiced. So uh, let's just try and get that out of the way. Um, weed biological control, in other words, the, the control of uh, plants, alien plants, uh, uses uh, mites and pathogens or insects from the country of origin. Uh, and they're released against the alien plants in the new range. And this practice is, is accompanied by a lot of testing, uh, usually under quarantine, usually over several years, to make sure that the agents are host-specific and they don't attack any other species. That's what we often get asked, uh, you know, what's, what's going to happen when the, the agent runs out of things to eat? Is it going to do a host switch to something else and start attacking native species? The answer is no. Uh, there are no examples uh, of where that has happened in an unpredicted way, and, and uh, I, I'd be willing to answer questions about that in the end. But it's a really a cheap, safe, and sustainable uh, way of doing things. So what I, what I want to speak, to, to speak about this morning uh, is what kind of information you require to quantify economic and social benefits of, of control. And the first thing you need to know is what impacts these invasive species have. And that's a biophysical question. Uh, you then need to know what the monetary value of these impacts are, and that's an economic question. Uh, you then know, need to know how these impacts affect people, so it's a social question. Uh, to what degree can management reduce these impacts? That's a management question. So you see a lot of different uh, uh, fields have to come together here. What about species that are both useful and harmful? Uh, how do we deal with those? That's a social question. And what returns on investment are gained from control? That's an economic question. Uh, now, when it comes to impacts, there have been very, very few studies. And, and the diagram you see in front of you now is uh, stuff that was done by my PhD student, Ross Shackleton who looked at uh, prosopis, mesquite trees that are invading across South Africa. And he looked at the, the density of these trees and what happens to things like native species density and native species richness. And what you can see is that as the, as the prosopis becomes more dense, the native species density goes down and the richness goes down quite dramatically. Now that's blindingly obvious, isn't it? I mean, you can just see it, but people have very seldom actually quantified this. So when we get to looking at economic benefits, we're often hampered by a lack of this kind of information. Uh, this is some work that I did on ecosystem services in South Africa. Now it's hard for me to explain this to you without a pointer, 
But this is uh, one of our biomes, the grassland biome. And if you look at the blue drop at the top, that's the effect of uh, invasives on water. The cow represents the effect of invasives on livestock production, and the green there is effect on biodiversity. Now, if you look at the water, the, the clear bar shows that we, we should be getting 26,000 uh, million cubic meters of water uh, from that biome every year. The gray bar shows 25 thousand and that's the reduction that's due to invasive alien plants uh, estimated at present and then the black bar is what would happen if uh, the entire area became fully invaded by invasive species so we'd lose half of our water supply out of the, the, the grassland biome we'd reduce the livestock production down to a quarter of what it potentially is and we'll lose more than half of our biodiversity. So those are, that's what can potentially happen uh, in these ecosystems if you allow them to become fully invaded. Now you go to the monetary value. So what we did there is we got uh, uh, values for um, water and for livestock and for biodiversity and we just multiplied it by the reductions. Uh, so ZAR is South African rands, and it's about uh, 15 rands to one US dollar. And we use that to estimate what the impact of invasive species was on ecosystem services. We also used questionnaire surveys, uh, we, you know, to get at the social kind of impacts, and we've done uh, the examples here are Puntia Stricta in Kenya, where we interviewed uh, households that are living with this uh, invasive cactus there. And in Zambia, we questioned households who are living with this uh, Tithonia, which is Mexican sunflower, the yellow uh, flowers there, that are both useful and invasive in those areas. So the cactus, they eat the fruits, and the Mexican sunflower is used for uh, a green manure fertilizer. And so from these questionnaire surveys, we found that uh, these are supposedly useful plants, but uh, respondents felt that the invasion often contributed to ill health and death of livestock. Uh, it reduced rangeland condition, affected human health, and, and affected mobility of both people and animals. Uh, people reported uh, economic losses of between uh, 500,000 US dollars per household a year. Now these are, these are poor people, so uh, that's a lot of money for them. And overall the net value was negative. So these things that are often promoted by aid agencies as a good solution are often actually net negative value that they produce. Um, then we've got to examine how effect of the control efforts are at reducing these impacts. And I'll start off with mechanical and chemical control uh, and then go on to biological control. Mechanical and chemical control can work at limited scales. You know, if you, if you go there and physically cut things down and, and poison them with chemicals or herbicides, provided that you stick to best practice, that you uh, have adequate funding, that you set yourself realistic goals, and uh, that you do proper planning and monitoring, you can have an effect. And I'll give you two examples from, from South Africa. The first one is from Shishlui Amphalosi in uh, KwaZulu-Natal province, and from the Berg River catchment in, in the Western Cape here. So Shishlui Amphalosi is a 100,000 hectare uh, protected area, and it's uh, important for grazing mammals like zebras and, and wildebeest, but also uh, one of the world's last populations of uh, grazing white rhinos. And those grasslands are being steadily replaced by a, a shrub called Chromalina odorata that was introduced from the Americas. Uh, and that's reducing the grazing available to these animals. Now, there was uh, some really innovative marking, marketing done here by a colleague of mine. So he, he took a map of Shishlui Amphalosi. And in 1985, he mapped the extent of, uh, he took the map of the extent of Chromalina, that's the shaded yellow bits at the top of the map. And in 1996, uh, another map which showed that it had spread quite a lot. Uh, and then in 2002, it was starting to become dense and covered the most of the area there. 
And then he took a, a leap into the future. And he, he told the politicians that uh, if you don't do something about this, what your reserve is going to look like, uh, you're going to lose all the grazing, you're going to lose all those animals, there's going to be huge impacts on tourism, which is important in the area. So please help us uh, control this thing. And it, it worked. <laughs> there was no science in it, but it worked. He was given something like 500 million rand to uh, control these, this, this weed in this area. And this shows what happened. Uh, in 1978, uh, chromolina was at low levels, and then you see it steadily increasing to cover almost 40% of that area by 2003. And then they started with mechanical clearing and follow-up operations, and they have reduced it to almost nothing. So there's an example of a, a, a purely mechanical uh, control operation that actually worked. Now, there was a number of factors that contributed to success. It was, it was a very well-run program. It had a diverse uh, steering committee. It had a rapid response team. It focused first on the areas of low infestation, where you'll get bigger returns on investment, flexible management approach, and so on. But the question is, can it last? Because as soon as you take your foot off the pedal there, the accelerator, what do you call it, the gas, you take your foot off the gas, uh, that, that shrub is just going to bounce back again. And, and uh, it's not going to last unless you perpetually keep that thing under mechanical control. The Berg River catchment is an area close to where I am now, uh, where they've built a dam supplying water to the city of Cape Town. And that catchment area there is invaded by pine trees from Europe and North America that were brought in for forestry and have escaped and are spreading all over the catchment and there you see some people mechanically clearing those uh, pine trees there. Now after a, a, a postdoc of mine did a study on this and she looked at the extent of invasion in 2001 that is the bar on the left hand side and in 2014 the bar on the right hand side and if you see the dark blue at the bottom that's the extent of the area that was covered by dense infestations in 2001. And you can see that has been reduced to very low levels in, by 2014. But this cost uh, a lot of money. It cost uh, 50 million rand to clear that catchment. And that was 7.2 times greater than an estimate we made in 1997. So we thought it would cost uh, seven times less and it ended up costing a whole lot more and the main thing is that we have not yet re reached a level where it's sort of in the maintenance phase where we can stand back and say, okay, we can easily control this with a small amount of money now. So yes, mechanical clearing has worked. It's reduced the uh, extent of the invasions, but they are going to come back unless we can keep funding it at, at this level. But when we, when we assess things at larger scales, it became clear that mechanical and chemical clearing doesn't work. And, and the map there is South Africa. And what you see there is data from uh, the South African Plant Invaders Atlas, which is continuously updated at a quarter degree square scale. Uh, and my colleagues, uh, Leslie Henderson and John Wilson, did an analysis of uh, the extent of uh, invasions by different species between 2006 and 2016. And on average, uh, individual species increased their range over those 10 years by 50%. Um, and when we looked at ongoing mechanical and chemical control at the scale, at the scale of the country, it had no detectable effect on the range. So things were spreading. We might be getting on top of them in small areas, but overall they're still spreading. But here's the remarkable thing. The uh, 33 alien plant species that had some biological control on them significantly slowed or reversed that spread. So they were the only species that were actually not spreading nationally uh, in this survey. Then we've got to ask what it costs to uh, mechanically or chemically manage invasive species. And here's some data from different studies. And what you see is that essentially, as the density of plants uh, goes up, 
the cost of clearing them goes up and it actually goes up quite exponentially so the denser it is it costs the more it costs to to clear those areas so the longer you leave those areas the more expensive it's going to be to clear them and this graph just shows hypothetically what can happen so if the cost of control goes up exponentially as uh, the area invaded or density be becomes higher and the cost of impact goes up in a linear fashion you're going to reach a point somewhere which says that uh, beyond this point it will cost you more to control that species than than what it's worth so the the cost of the impacts is less than the cost of control and at that point you cannot justify uh, controlling species anymore it just costs you too much then you're left with the situation that only biological control is a sustainable uh, unless you're going to tackle these invasions at, at small scales. So this is the model we use to look at uh, returns on investment from biological control. So we've got a number of points there. If, an, if a species is uh, introduced to an area, what happens is that it starts off at low levels and spreads uh, in an in S-curve over time and until at some point it reaches uh, a situation where it's, covered, it's occupied all of the available habitat. So we normally know the date that that weed was introduced sometime in the past and we can estimate uh, the area that will be occupied when it reaches its, its full extent. And the shape of that curve is determined by the rate of spread, which we can, we can estimate from various surveys over time. And we also know the date in which the biological control agent was introduced. And we know what the current date is, and we know what the area currently invaded is. So the difference between the area that's currently invaded and the area that would have been invaded had it not been for the biological control is the difference between these two. Now that area has been saved and presumably the impacts associated with that additional uh, invasion have been saved as well. And here's some examples from South Africa where we can say this has actually happened. A prickly pear, a puntia ficus indica, Biological control introduced in 1933 took it right down to uh, manageable levels. Hakia, a shrub from Australia, uh, has also been brought down by biological control. Red water fern, uh, under complete biological control now, it's not a problem anymore. And Australian wattles, which we think we're starting to get on top of as well. Um, the review of returns and investment from biological control in South Africa uh, have been estimated from the reductions that we've reductions that will result in water runoff rangeland productivity land value biodiversity and so on so if you've saved an area from becoming invaded you've saved the cost of those uh, impacts and the benefit cost ratios uh, on some of the plants that we brought under biological control range from eight to one to over three thousand to one and that's that's phenomenal that means for every uh, dollar you invest in biological control your return is either eight dollars or three thousand dollars or somewhere in between now i bet any of you would uh, invest your money in a company like this um here's just some pictures uh, the Karoo, uh, a dry area part of our country in 1920, was completely invaded by these cactuses, uh, Puntia ficus indica. People had to, to abandon the land. They couldn't farm there anymore. And the introduction of a biological control uh, removed all of that. And there you see the same area in 1970, no cactuses left. People can return to the land. They can carry on with uh, livestock farming and so on. Um, red water fern, uh, uh, something that causes quite a lot of economic damage on, on dams, has been brought under complete biological control by this tiny little weevil, uh, which you just release one or two of them on the dam and within uh, a month or two, the entire area is clear of, of this weed. You know, sheep would uh, walk out on that thing thinking it was a lawn and they'd drown. Um, 
clogged up water uh, water pumps, all sorts of problems there, and it's it's completely under control now. Um, here's an example from Europe. Uh, colleague of mine, uh, Urs Schaffner, he's, he's been doing this work. So this ragweed uh, produces a highly allergenic pollen, uh, which causes lots of medical problems. And biological control has been shown to reduce the population significantly. And connected to that, it reduces the allergenic effects by, by about half. And this translates into medical cost savings of between five and six million euros annually. And this is not for the whole of Europe, this is just for the study area, which is a small part of Italy. So when you ramp, ramp that up to the whole of Europe, the, the savings are phenomenal. And this study gave uh, cost benefit ratios of 69 to one to 90 to one. So for every $1 invested between 69 and $90 in saved medical costs. Parthenium weed is another uh, example in Australia. It, it's uh, a, a lot of research on biological control done there. Uh, spent a lot of money over the past 27 years. But it's been brought not under complete control, but it's a lot more easy to control mechanically now because of the biological control. And there they've had uh, cost-benefit ratios of 7 to 2, but it's set to grow because the benefits are, are reaped every year. We've got this weed now in South Africa and we're going flat out to try and get as much biological control onto it as, as possible because it's going to have enormous impacts here as well. <coughs> and then you get to species that are conflict species where you have uh, species that are both useful and, and harmful. Pine trees is my favorite example. Pine trees are not native to this part of the world, but. Uh, on the right hand side there you see an orderly plantation and stacks of timber that comes out of those plantations. On the left hand side you see those pine trees invading natural ecosystems where they impact on biodiversity, they use a lot more water than the native vegetation and they increase uh, the problem of, of wildfires. So uh, costs and benefits, how do you deal with those things? Uh, uh, here was a, 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 a early test case. It's a, it's a plant called Patterson's Curse, Echium plantagenium. I have a bit of difficulty pronouncing that, about as much difficulty as you have pronouncing my name. But uh, anyway, this, uh, this plant was in Australia causing annual losses in 1985 of uh, 25 million uh, Australian dollars per year. And uh, in 1985, there's a lot more money than it is today. But the, the problem was that the uh, beekeepers also used the species or, or utilized the species as uh, fodder for bees and honey production and pollination services. So when they're talking about uh, releasing a biological control agent, there was resistance from the beekeeping fraternity. So they commissioned a economic study and they found that the detrimental effects of this weed outweighed the benefits by a factor of 10 to 1. And on the basis of that, they had gained permission to release the biological control agent. And the benefits from that control uh, are approximately $1.2 billion uh, Australian dollars in, in 2005. And it's probably a bigger number by today. So to come back to where I live, uh, one of our worst weeds here is an Australian tree called black wattle. And uh, in 1997, uh, in 1977, the, the uh, wattle industry published a paper called Acacia, it was an acronym for a case against controlling introduced acacias, but they never spelled that out in the paper. And they argued that we can't think of biologically controlling this plant because it is so valuable. It's, it produces timber, it produces all kinds of products. So in 2001, uh, a team that I was part of carried out a cost-benefit study that showed that if we do nothing, we carry on as business as usual, allowing this thing to invade, that would give you a benefit cost ratio of 0.4 to 1. In other words, it's not sustainable. It's costing more than what the value is that it brings. But if you combine it with seed attacking biological control, uh, that would be the most attractive uh, uh, option and it would give you a benefit cost rate of four to one. 
So seed attacking a biological control means that you can still grow the tree, you can still use the timber, you can still use the product. It just doesn't produce as many seeds and that makes it less invasive. So in 2008, a seed feeding biological control agent was released. And, and this is a little melanterious weevil. And it gets into the seed pods, it gets bores into the seeds, and it eats the seeds out. So the, the seed production on this uh, plant is now much less. But it, it wasn't enough. So in, uh, you know, these, these trees produced a phenomenal amount of seeds because they had none of these insects on them anymore. So Acacia mernsii, we introduced a, a small uh, gall-forming fly, a tiny little insect that lays its eggs in the flowers, developing flowers of the, of the plant. And instead of developing into a seed pod, it develops into galls like this. So it produces no seeds. Released in 2004. And where I live now in Stellenbosch, uh, this tree, you see it in the street often, it produces no more seeds. It just produces galls. So this is fantastic because you can now grow it as an ornamental tree, you can grow it for timber, it just won't produce these seeds anymore. Then you have to ask also, what are the consequences of not using biological control? Because people often feel that it's just too dangerous, it's not safe, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't not use it. And the simple answer is it, it's simply not going to be possible to control a large number of invasive alien plant species without biological control. As we've seen, they, they continue to spread even though you spend a lot of money on trying to contain them. But those that do have biological control, it's much more feasible to try and contain them. And these impacts will grow as the invasions grow. There's still a lot of space for them to occupy and the impacts will just get worse and worse. So what you have to consider as well is uh, the risks of not adopting biological control because uh, you, often people consider the risk of uh, introducing a biological control agent, but they don't specifically consider the risks of not adopting it. So before you make decisions about this, please consider that as well. Uh, I even found a cartoon about this. Uh, we've considered every potential risk except the risk of avoiding all risk. <laughs> And, and this is something you need to think about. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I would say that weed biological control, when it works, it's not going to work on every single plant, but it can deliver spectacular returns on investment. And once an invasive alien plant becomes widespread, it's actually the only sustainable way you're going to contain that problem and prevent ongoing impacts. And our growing understanding of these impacts and their social and economic importance underscores the value of this biological control. So the more we find out about how people are not happy with these, these situations, uh, the more important it becomes to, to look at this. So this, I think, needs to be uh, widely communicated, and that's what I'm trying to do. But I think that's the end of my... Uh, presentation and I'm, I'm not sure if people would like to ask questions I suppose we have about a few minutes left to do that